Hi there. My name is Aaron Landman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. This is going to be the last main lecture on the theory of infinite impulse response filters in EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing, although I will do one more video where I'll just look at some examples. We've previously looked at the frequency responses of both finite and infinite impulse response filters. We saw that if you put an infinitely long sinusoidal signal into a linear time invariant system, you get an infinitely long sinusoidal signal out with the same frequency, but the amplitude and the phase may be changed according to the frequency response evaluated at that frequency. Of course, in real life, we don't have infinitely long signals. You have a system sitting there, you walk up to it, and then you give it a sinusoid. In this lecture, we'll talk about the consequences of switching on the sinusoid at a particular time. In this lecture, we'll focus on this example of a first-order IIR filter. We'll first use the idea of frequency response to figure out what the output is if the input is a forever sinusoid. We'll then compute what the output is if the input is a unit step function. We've done this sort of thing before, but we took a fairly brute force approach of working through the recursion. In this lecture, we'll compute the output using Z transforms. This is generally easier for most problems. Finally, we will use Z transforms to compute the output for this instant on cosine and see how the result relates to the first two cases. For case 1, we're putting in a cosine with a frequency of 0.2 pi. We can get the frequency response by evaluating the system function at e to the j omega hat. Here omega hat equals 0.2 pi, and then putting the result in polar form gives us this. So we know the output is going to be a cosine with the same frequency of 0.2 pi. What is the amplitude of the output? Well, it's going to be the amplitude of the input, which is 1, times the magnitude of the frequency response. And the phase of the output is going to be the phase of the input, which is 0, plus the angle of the frequency response. For the second case, we'll figure out what the output is if the input is a unit step function. To do this with Z transforms, remember that convolution in the time domain corresponds to multiplication in the Z transform domain. Here I have the system function, and I'll just multiply that by the z transform of the unit step function, which is 1 over 1 minus z to the minus 1. This is like our usual a to the n un pair with a equals 1. Now we can perform a partial fraction expansion. So we'll take the first term here and multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 minus z to the minus 1, and then take the second term and multiply its numerator and denominator by 1 plus 0.8 z to the minus 1. That will allow us to write this in terms of a common denominator. So if I take the resulting numerator and group the constant terms, I get a plus b. And then if I group the terms that are coefficients of z to the minus 1, I wind up with 0.8b minus a. So we can write two equations. We can write a plus b equals the constant term of my original numerator, which is 5. And then I can write 0.8b minus a equals the coefficient of the z to the minus 1 term in my original numerator. But there is no z to the minus 1 term, so I write equals 0. Solving these two equations for a and b gives us a equals 20 over 9 and b equals 25 over 9. So plugging those values for a and b into this form gives me this z transform which I can invert using our tables to give us the output in the time domain. We see that the first term decays as n goes to infinity, so we consider that the transient part. The second term keeps going forever, so we consider that the steady state part. So our signal approaches that constant of 25 over 9 as n goes to infinity. Now here's the interesting part. You could get that 25 over 9 just by plugging omega hat equals zero into the frequency response. So yeah, we put in a unit step function, but if you wait long enough, you get the same output as if you had just put in a unit constant for all time. That first term, the transient term, is shown here in the top graph. 
the steady state term is shown in the second graph, and the sum of those two terms, the actual output, is shown in the bottom graph. Notice that the minus sign here gives this function this alternating sign characteristic. That corresponds to a decaying sinusoid with a frequency of omega hat equals pi, which is the highest frequency you can represent in a discrete time system. That corresponds to a pole on the left-hand side of the z-plane on the real axis. And indeed, you see that there's this initial blip from turning on that constant, but once you wait for a little bit, it's like you've always been putting in a constant. Notice that for this to work, we need this pole to be inside the unit circle, so this so-called transient term actually decays. Now it's time for our third case. We're going to put in cosine 0.2 pi n times un. Here we're going to use a little trick. Because h is real valued, we can play a game where we put in the complex sinusoid e to the j 0.2 pi n and then take the real part to get the cosine. So to compute this convolution, we'll multiply the z transforms of the functions. Here we are writing that first order transfer function in a more general form. Later we'll plug in 5 for b0 and minus 0.8 for a1. And we'll plug in 0.2 pi for omega naught hat. Now in the second example, when we computed the output where the input was a unit step function, we performed a partial fraction expansion by solving a system of equations. And you can do that here, but here we're going to use an alternative technique called the residue method. The idea is that to find a coefficient for a specific term, you can take your system function where the denominator is expressed as a bunch of pulled factors multiplied together, and you multiply that by the pull factor associated with that particular coefficient, that winds up canceling it in the denominator. And then you evaluate that result at that particular pull. Once you have those coefficients, it's easy to take the inverse transforms of the individual terms. Now, I should mention that this description here only works for single poles. If you have double poles or other higher order poles, you can use the residue method on that, but it gets more complicated. But we generally don't get into that in EC 2026. I do cover that kind of material in EC 3084 in the context of inverting Laplace transforms. So let's think about taking this system function that's written in terms of these factors and multiplying it by this 1 minus a1 z to the minus 1. That winds up canceling this factor, and we could imagine covering it up with our thumb. So this is sometimes called the cover-up method. We then take what's left over, and we plug in the particular pole, which is A1. Notice we will have something like 1 over A1, and if you multiply the numerator and the denominator by A1, we wind up with an A1 up here and an A1 here. Now to figure out the coefficient for the second term, we imagine multiplying the system function by this 1 minus e to the j omega hat 0, z to the minus 1. So we imagine covering up this factor. And now we plug e to the j omega hat in for z, which gives us this e to the minus j omega hat naught here. OK, that was all a bit fiddly. But now we have the coefficient that goes with our term with the pole of a1. And we have the coefficient that goes with our pole of e to the j omega naught hat n. Notice here I'm using the term pole generically to refer to the roots of a denominator, and not necessarily just the roots of the denominator of a system function. Now, this coefficient is particularly interesting because that's big H e to the j omega naught hat. That is the frequency response. So now we can plug in the numbers associated with our particular example. Notice the frequency response evaluated at omega hat equals 0.2 pi sitting right here. So it's easy enough to invert that. It's particularly convenient to leave this coefficient in rectangular form and convert this coefficient to polar form as you see here. So when we take the real part, this minus j.8 goes away, and this complex sinusoid turns into a cosine. 
with the amplitude given by this magnitude, 2.92, and phase given by this angle, 0.28. So we have this decaying transient term and a steady state term. Now, in a lot of applications, you don't really care about the transient term. You know it's going to go away, so you might as well just focus on the steady state term, which you can easily get with the frequency response, and not mess with the partial fraction expansions. So the complete output is on the top. It's the sum of the transient term, shown in the middle, and this instant on cosine, shown on the bottom. And you can see that, after this initial glitch, the output looks like a cosine.